Good morning, good morning. Thanks for joining us, those of you here and those of you watching online. Uh, we're excited to bring this to you, and we have our nice handheld mics today, so hold them up close. Use your singing voice. Um, so welcome to State of Defense. This is our first live version of State of Defense. For those of you who don't know, a little background. Uh, we are Defense One. I'm the executive editor. Uh, we are a, a, a spin-off brand of Government Executive and the Government Executive Media Group, which is part of Atlantic Media, the company that's, that runs the, the Atlantic, as most of you know, our sister brand. Um, and about five years ago when we started, we, we wanted to do something at the beginning of the year when a lot of other publications kind of look back and, and put out their list of the 10 best stories of the previous year. We wanted to look ahead. We always do the future of defense. And so we started to come up with this feature package of stories uh, timed around the State of the Union, call it the State of Defense, uh, have, a, have a top line, a top level uh, assessment of the land of how things are looking for the year ahead, and then individual articles for each of the services, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, pretty standard. This year, we delayed it a little bit because the administration was still uh, working on their new defense strategy themselves. Their national security strategy came out in, I think, early December. And then uh, the national defense strategy that followed out of the Pentagon. Uh, and so we wanted to you know, wait a little bit to get a clear guidance of what the administration's priorities were going to be and what the first, <clears throat> the first real budget request from this administration would look like as well. So we're hoping today to talk about both of those things, policy uh, and budget. Uh, the high and the low. So we'll talk a little bit about the state of global affairs and the United States in them and this administration and Congress and everyone else that has a stake in what's going on today. And as well as um, all the way down to the, the, the nitty gritty, uh, the, the hardware, the weapon systems, the provisions in the, in the bills and the NDAA, anything you'd like to bring up as well when we turn to audience questions uh, for these two senators who have graciously joined us this morning. Um, so a frame of mind that, that I'll, I'll bring because I get to, it's my event. Um, <laughs> I, just, I, I just came from the Brussels Forum last week. And the Brussels Forum is put on by the German Marshall Fund and is an annual uh, gathering. It's a transatlantic focus gathering. So it's Europeans and Washingtonians coming together to talk about the state of not just military alliances, but really economic affairs, uh, the finance ministers, members of parliament from across the EU. And it's a, good, it's a good touchstone for European attitudes about the United States, confidence in the United States, priorities, what they're looking at. Last year's forum, around the same time of year, was a bit of a freak out about Brexit and about Trump. And you have a lot of the foreign policy practitioners from Europe tend to, tend to skew on the left of side of things, uh, kind of going, what, what, oh my god, what just happened? What are we going to do about it? And how do we react? So this year is one year on, and the, the attitude was a little different, a little bit more settled, and it also followed the Munich conference, which was, uh, the reports out of Munich were that, were, but were in short, and I wrote this in our State of Defense piece, uh, some of the reports were that the, the, the mood was that, uh, well, okay, the world didn't end, as some people worried about it, but things are pretty unstable in some ways, and how are we gonna find new relationships, new power centers? And one of the outputs of this year that I want to begin by asking you about was that there was a lot of talk this year about working with the United States in ways other than with the White House, that this administration is a little erratic, they have a lot of turnover, it's hard to read the president you know, with a tweet one morning and a policy change the next morning, but there are a lot of other ways to have relationships with the U.S. that are different, that they're par from parliament to Congress from agency to agency, industry to industry, you know, academics to academics, lots of other ways besides heads of state and the president. So while this is going on, in this big context, uh, I want to ask your thoughts, both you senators, about, about that, about the state of the United States to the rest of the world. You've been on some codels, you've done some travel, and then we'll go down from there. And I've asked them both to have some opening remarks, so I think we'll start with our, our ranking order here, which would be Senator Ernst, uh, please give us your thoughts. Thank you. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you, Kevin and Defense One for inviting us in this morning to have this important conversation. I do serve on the Senate Armed Services Committee. I am a veteran. I served 23 years between the Army Reserves and Iowa Army National Guard. I served as a company commander from 2003 to 2004 in Kuwait and Iraq. Uh, very proud of my service and glad, uh, glad to have done it. It really brings a unique perspective onto the 
the Armed Services Committee. Um, Senator Peters is also a former service member, and so we, we bring that aspect to a committee that sometimes uh, has members that don't necessarily have the same type of experience. So I know we're, we're both very, very proud of that. I serve as the uh, chairperson for the Subcommittee on Emerging Threats and Capabilities, and in that capacity, one, I have oversight of uh, SOCOM and those operations, but we also dive into areas um, where we see emerging or re-emerging threats, such as Russia, China, North Korea. Love to do the deep dive into those areas. Uh, it has been a great experience. So proud to serve Iowa on the Armed Services Committee. So glad to be with you, Kevin, and I, I look forward to the discussion this morning. Thanks for the intro. And Senator, your, your, yourself, give us a little bit of your background. I mean, I know we have Army on the left, so now we have Navy. So now now right. for the Navy to, to speak right. out uh, as well. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you for the kind invitation. It's wonderful to be with all of you to talk about this issue. As Senator Ernst mentioned, uh, I uh, served uh, in the Navy, Navy Reserve, uh, was a lieutenant commander in a number of uh, positions there. Uh, the one that I particularly enjoyed was with the Seabees, uh, doing the, the can-do kind of attitude there with the Seabees and running around the... Uh, the woods with the Marines at Camp Lejeune and other places, uh, which was uh, very interesting. But uh, I uh, really enjoy working with Senator Ernst uh, as well on the Armed Services Committee. And in addition to Armed Services, I also serve on the Homeland Security Committee. So national security issues are very important to me. And with those two committees, I get to work with the home team and the away team when it comes to national security and uh, pull that uh, together. I serve on the committee uh, with Joni as well on emerging capabilities. Uh, we are also, uh, we are uh, uh, co-chairs of two caucuses together, so we uh, work together. We are co-chair of the uh, Albanian uh, caucus, and, uh, and in fact, I think you'll probably talk about your National Guard units uh, that are in uh, Kosovo. Uh, and I have a very large active Albanian community in Michigan, which brought me to that issue, but we deal with those uh, issues related to that. Uh, and then we're on, uh, we're also co-chairs of the Motorcycle Caucus, so uh, we, we hope that we'll get questions related to that. That would be really great uh, here today and the potential implications uh, for that uh, going forward. But it's, uh, uh, we also recently came back uh, last year, we were both uh, in Iraq uh, and Afghanistan uh, and uh, uh, brought that perspective or bring that perspective uh, to us in armed services. The other one that's relevant to our discussions here today uh, on Homeland Security is government affairs. I'm the ranking member on the Federal Spending Oversight Committee. Uh, Rand Paul is the uh, chair of that committee and the two of us are working on a variety of issues uh, working uh, or, or related to federal spending. In fact, uh, uh, we uh, intend to send some of our folks over to Afghanistan to take a look at some of the spending that's going on there and that's something we can chat about. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see that report from <laughs> Afghanistan spending. Well, so, you know, I, I talked to your staff beforehand, and I noticed about what, what about your, your priorities on, on bills and issues this year, and there's some overlapping themes, um, and some of the, you know, rapidly deploying technology, artificial intelligence, um, cybersecurity, uh, the DOD audit. Uh, these are very, you know, future-looking, um, you know, aspects of, of defense. Um, but before we get into that, we you know we're we're in a we're in a world that's you know somewhat going backward. If you look at the national defense strategy, the new the new priorities are the old priorities. It's Russia, it's China, and the administration has signaled that that's their new priority, and it caused a little bit of worry or, or consternation about well wait a minute we're still in some counterterrorism wars. Uh, that's low level stuff. Those are operators with you know night vision goggles. That's not nuclear weapons and ICBMs and bombers. Um, so how, talk about how, how your committee is managing um, both those, the, these new priorities that the administration has declared and your thoughts as, as you know, oversight practitioners uh, about the state of the Pentagon now. It was, there was you know, a bit of a delay, a little longer than usual for a new administration to get their policy people in office, to get some, um, to, frankly, to get some of the nominees confirmed and passed through the Senate. Um, uh, what, what are the things you're seeing as oversight oversight practitioners, what's the word, as members of the Center Armed Services Committee uh, on those right. issues? Well, certainly we, we do have those, what we call re-emerging threats out there. And they are the, you know, it's like the uh, 60 is the new 40, maybe, I don't know. Um, but it it is Russia, it is China. We see a much stronger North Korea. And 
where we serve on the Emerging Threats and Capabilities Committee, a lot of that does merge then with the operators that are on the ground uh, doing counterterrorism activities, doing train advise and assist missions. So we have those top line threats and we tend to focus on uh, nuclear, of course, is out there and counter WMD is now uh, a duty or a responsibility for our SOF operators. They have taken on that responsibility in the last couple of years. So we have the emergence of uh, those top line big bad actors, those that have nefarious intentions, uh, combined with how do we counter this using smaller groups, um, our operators in the field, training, advising, and assisting uh, more indigenous armies or forces in neighboring countries. So take, for example, Ukraine pushing back against Russia, those examples. Well, can, can the U.S. do both, I think is what, what I'm thinking. Can, does, does the Pentagon have the resources right now? Is the, is the, is the administration focused on the right policies to, to handle both of these? The U.S. can do both. Can they do both at the same time is maybe the question. How many theaters of, of uh, engagement can we operate in? Uh, the resources that we have now limit us, I would say, limit us. Our personnel numbers limit us. Our capabilities can limit us. Um, we are in, in a phase right now, if you look at the number of active duty brigade combat teams within our army, out of 31, uh, we have three that could fight tonight. So we are currently limited because we have not maintained. We have not sustained. So can we? Yes, we can. Um, but if we're given multiple theaters of engagement, it would be very, very difficult. Senator Peters, what do you think about that? About the and this is a this is a standard line we hear um, not just from Republicans, but from you know more the hawkish sides of of the Congress that the U.S. doesn't have the funds, the size of the force, much less you know some of the equipment to handle all of the threats that have been put on it by the civilian policymaker and the threats, the the missions the responsibilities put on it by civilian policymakers. Do you agree with that? Well, I, I think it is uh, very tough, and it's going to be tougher now as we uh, ramp up and make sure that we're <clears throat> able to counter what uh, Russians are doing and the Chinese, which are really the major emerging power that we have to, to deal with. But I think it's important to put in, in perspective that we aren't going to be able to throw more money at this either. This is, we, we did have a big increase uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, budget cycle. That's not sustainable. Uh, we just had a large tax uh, cut that took a trillion and a half dollars out of the budget, maybe two trillion, depending on who you're looking at uh, or who you're talking to about that. Uh, it's not sustainable to continue to spend this kind of money, so we have to be a whole lot smarter with how we're spending the money. Now, I'm a, I'm a strong believer in making sure the military gets the money that they need as a former member of the armed services myself. National security is a priority. But we can do it a whole lot more efficiently uh, than it's being done right now. It's something I hope we're going to be digging in with our financial uh, oversight uh, committee uh, and looking at Afghanistan and other areas. But you've got a procurement process that is, uh, is simply out of whack. The amount of money that we spend, the time is involved. I mean, warfare is going to be changing in absolutely dramatic ways, in, in ways that we can't mis maybe fully appreciate over the next uh, 10 years. We've got to be a whole lot faster. We've got to be a whole lot efficient. The fact that the Pentagon can't do audits uh, without significant issues and problems uh, is a serious problem. There's no American corporation that can exist without having any idea where a lot of its money is going. So, so we have to do that a whole lot better, or you're not going to get support from the American people. At some point, that's going to catch up, although the needs are there, and, and it's a dangerous world. And, and this, this move away from, uh, uh, from the terrorist threat when other terrorist activities are springing up. I was recently you know, in Afghanistan, in Nigeria, and very concerned with what's happened, uh, happening there with ISIS of West Africa. So yeah, it's, uh, it's not as if that threat is going away in any ways. In many ways, it's becoming uh, worse uh, as it's becoming more dispersed around the globe. But we've got to do this more efficiently or it's not going to happen. You, you said a lot there, and I want to definitely get back to the spread of terrorism in Africa, but on audits specifically, because I know a lot of our audience pays attention to that. Frankly, I've heard this for, for a decade now, that, that the Pentagon needs an audit, has to do better auditing, or else what? What's the motivation to change them? How are you going to, how are you going to get them to you know, get that act together and start to count every penny? Do, is there, do you have any leverage over them? 
Well, I, I do think as Congress we have that leverage, and it does come back to the budget. Uh, if we're not seeing improvement within the DOD and greater efficiency, then we have the opportunity to scale back in ways that we think will force them to be more efficient. Now, we don't want to hurt the warfighter, um, but the threat of, of a decreasing budget for the DOD could be very detrimental to them. So they want to step up and do what they can. At least that's the, the feeling that I get from this current administration. Now, Secretary Mattis, through his confirmation process, he assured me, uh, he assured uh, me again in front of the committee that he would do everything he could to make sure that we had an audit we have an audit right now, and I sat down with the comptroller, uh, David Norquist, just a few weeks ago, and we talked about the progress that we are uh, going through with the current audit. And engaged in that, the audit will cost us some dollars. Um, and, and Mr. Norquist had let us know up front, this is going to be very costly. This is the first time that we have done an audit of this scale at the DOD. We have 24 standalone audits that will be done within the department. We have over 1,200 auditors that are deployed right now um, at the Pentagon and various sites that are going through this audit. And we know by the time it's all said and done, the cost of this audit will uh, approach probably around $900 million. But we do hope to find greater efficiencies uh, when that audit is completed. And the White House anticipates we could save $46 uh, billion over the next five years. Uh, what we hear from DOD is that they could see maybe an average of $6 billion savings a year for the next 10 years. So some differences in the numbers there, but if we are ferreting out waste, fraud, and abuse across the system, making sure that we are efficient and accountable for those dollars, uh, I, we're moving in the right direction. We have to do it. And, and I'll say, it, and it's just uh, its just not fr waste, fraud, and abuse. It's just there are the types of performance metrics that you need to say, are you actually accomplishing this goal, spending the amount of money that you're doing? You know, in the private industry, uh, if you're leading that effort and you're way over budget time and time again, uh, you're probably not with that company anymore. There are some severe uh, repercussions uh, for that. We have to instill that kind of culture in the folks who are managing the Department of Defense as well, because you have a set amount of money, you've got these performance goals, you better achieve them, and you can't keep having cost overruns and all that's not necessarily uh, fraud and abuse. It's just bad, bad management. And that simply can't occur in the Department of Defense when, as you rightly say, the demands for the Department of Defense are going up uh, uh, quite uh, significantly. And we're not going to be able to match that with resources. And the American people are tired of just throwing money at everything in government, not just the Department of Defense, everything in government. Only at the Pentagon do you spend a billion to save Six billion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Th yeah. That wouldn't. Uh, that would not give you much of a bonus in the private sector. I'll tell you that. Right. Right. Well, we'll see. I don't know, Senator Ernst. If I if I if I buy that, there, you know, that this administration or Congress would withhold money from the Pentagon when it just seems to all be going or up. Withhold jobs. Or withhold <laughs> jobs. Right. Uh, um, but uh, but it. But we have a first. We have some. This is new. And um, is there a timeline for when the deliverables are supposed to come? Um, yes. Yeah, so we anticipate over the next year. So we will see pieces of that audit come forward. So one thing that I, I had asked Mr. Norquist about was as those results from those standalone audits are coming forward, when there are findings, will those be released to Congress? And he said, absolutely, of course they will. And the uh, anticipated response for those findings would be then instead of waiting for the entire audit to be done and then start making corrections, to go ahead and start making the corrections as the findings uh, come to light. So uh, we do know that audits cost money. Audits cost money, and the scale of our Pentagon, we know that it is a very large bureaucratic organization. We have to start somewhere. Things will not get better unless we start somewhere. Good. All right. So moving off of audits, because everyone loves talking about it. I'm trying to, I'm trying to picture, you said 1,000 a, a deployed auditors. I'm trying to imagine auditors going, 1,200 going through, you know, like basic <laughs> deployment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, moving on from that, you know, another way for efficiencies, both of you uh, had are interested in things like artificial intelligence, rapid deployment technology. In what ways uh, uh, is you know your committee or are, are the new, you know the NDAA, the new budget, 
uh, working to to press that forward because we hear over and over again from from the Pentagon uh, and you know and the leaders around the world that one of their top concerns is is this so-called declining gap in the technological advantage the United States has over its adversaries. Still have that still have a, a pretty big advantage, but the gap is somehow shrinking and there's a there's a race to fill it. So um, how does that filter down to you as, on the Senate? What are your concerns, either as members of your, of your committee, but also as representatives of your state, where a lot of these you know, products are, or technologies are being developed? Well, I'll take the, uh, the first stab at it, uh, because uh, it does represent the future of warfare that will transform uh, how we fight. And the one aspect that I'm uh, particularly involved in is autonomy, autonomous uh, systems. And that's uh, because of my location in Michigan, and, and obviously autonomous is a big issue for the auto industry right now that's moving forward at a, a very aggressive pace. I serve on the Commerce Committee, and I'm working with Senator Thune on a bipartisan basis to pass the AV Start Act, which will facilitate the development of self-driving vehicles uh, on our roads. It's happened a whole lot quicker than I think uh, people uh, realize. Uh, in fact, Ford Motor Company has announced that they're going to have their uh, first fully self-driving car. This means no steering wheel. Uh, no brake pedal. You just get in and it drives. They're going to and they're going to have that coming off an assembly line. I mean that they have they have their test vehicles now, but actually coming off an assembly line in 2021. So that's in three years. Uh, we're going to have General Motors uh, is telling me uh, that they're going to beat Ford. They haven't said what, uh, how, by how much, uh, but they're uh, pretty focused on doing that, which is great. Uh, and and then we've got German automakers, Chinese, Asian automakers uh, coming very quickly as well. Bombers. That'd be good for you know. Yeah. Yeah, the Pentagon would like that. that. They made bombers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, we did do that, uh, Michigan and Ford, too. You know, with, in fact, the, the major testing uh, facility, the American Center for Mobility, that will be testing all of these self-driving cars is on the site of the Willow Run, which was the uh, Ford factory that sent the B-24 bombers, part of the arsenal of democracy. So it's uh, interesting. And it shows that really how the two industries are together. We have TARDAC, which does advance uh, Army research uh, in Michigan, have been a leaders uh, in autonomy as well. And, uh, and the importance of that, self-driving, will save warfighters' lives. We had more, more soldiers killed uh, in logistics operations than we did in combat, so if we take the driver out. But then those autonomous systems fit in with drones and, and uh, all sorts of uh, weapon systems going ahead. But I think the lesson from this, and, and what we're going to be pushing to your question about with the Pentagon, too, is that you know in the past, a lot of technological innovation usually came out of uh, the Department of Defense, came out of contractors, came out of DARPA. But now you're just seeing so much in the way of advancement coming out of the private sector that we've got to build these parts. And in private sector companies, they may not be defense related. And certainly in the artificial intelligence area, that's the place where it's going at a significant rate, that we've got to be building those partnerships and thinking creative ways of creating an organization that doesn't look at the procurement process as it does right now, where the Army tells us that it takes about 16 years to develop a new, uh, a new system. Uh, 16 years, uh, the world's going to change pretty dramatically in 16 years from where we are right now. And so how do we incorporate some of those advanced management systems that break down silos between industries, uh, between technologies? Uh, that's what we're going to be working on. I think a, a lot of life-saving techniques out there. Uh, Senator Peters talked about the autonomous vehicles, which you know, again, using autonomous type vehicles, whether it's um, airplanes, uh, warplanes, submarines that are autonomous, very important. And we do talk about the, the life-saving measures. I think about the drivers uh, that were killed by IEDs just driving through Iraq and Afghanistan all these years. Um, but also areas of artificial intelligence as well, using drone technology and aerial imaging where you can take AI, apply it to the images that are being transmitted back, and through various algorithms and uh, processes, they can identify uh, the images and narrow that down for our intelligence operators so they can better understand what's on the ground. So using artificial intelligence in a way that will speed up the processes to on the ground um, for intelligence. But Gary is right in that uh, our acquisitions process is broken and we can say that time and time again but what we do is have to really put this into action, put our, our 
you know, our money where our mouth is. And if we expect to get the latest and greatest technology out to our war fighters, we have to do things differently. Streamline that process. Use off-the-shelf technology because Gary is right. We have innovators out there in the private industry that are developing technology that could be useful to us immediately. And if we wait too long, three, six, nine months a year, it may be too late. So uh, we have to be very speedy about what we do in Congress as well to enable them uh, to get those products into the hands of the warfighter. I just, I just wanted to add uh, on the uh, artificial intelligence yeah. aspect and how it ties to, to autonomy uh, and, and why they'll move so quickly. In fact, I, I spent a fair amount of time out in Silicon Valley talking about these issues related to what's going on in autos. But as they describe it, self-driving cars, which are happening really quickly, are basically the moonshot for artificial intelligence. Is that when that happens and uh, you have AI systems that can take in all of that data and drive an automobile through a complex city environment like we have uh, here in Washington, D.C. Or, or New York City. Uh, that means uh, artificial intelligence is ready for prime time in every single industry you can possibly imagine. And so if you look at this timeline of three years, four years for these cars to be deployed on a, on a line, uh, that's where AI is going to be uh, very quickly. Uh, we like, and I'll just throw a plug in for Michigan, given the fact that, you know, we're uh, doing the autonomous, uh, you'll see Michigan change quite a bit as well. A lot of the Silicon Valley companies are now coming to be close uh, to where these, uh, the automotive uh, technology is. So I mean, AI is supposed to be the answer to a lot of problems. And one of the problems is the, is the demand, as you said, on the, you know, warfighter, or the demand on the mission set is coming out of the counterterrorism wars. And you know, it all kind of traces back to the, the first drones, going from you know, SD to HD and taking in so much information and so many drones and so much video that humans can't keep up with it. So we've got to develop AI to, to do these things for us. So bring you back to, to switch a little bit to, to the discussion toward in policy and the missions overseas. We're at a point now in the ISIS war, just for example, that the ISIS geographic war is coming to, a, to, the, to its near end in that small area between Iraq and Syria. But the counterterrorism mission is spreading across Af North Africa. Just, let's just start there. This is an enormous space. There aren't enough drones in the military to cover that space for every operator on the ground. There aren't enough operators on the ground to go after every, every ungoverned possible space, which is supposed to be the mission. So where, you know, where do you see the future heading with, with this when it comes to making choices about how much the United States should take on as, as the you know, counterterrorism force for the world with its allies? How much industry should look into this to be making the next drones uh, or the next whatever it is, whatever the next technologies are. And uh, this is all under the umbrella of this Trump administration, which in almost every form of, of government tends to zigzag one way or another. Is there enough um, continuity of or predictability, let's say, I mean, that's a, a word we hear a lot on the Pentagon. Is there enough predictability to, to be going in the right direction to tackle that threat with the right technologies, with the right uh, sustainability? I think that's a very broad question um, there, On but <laughs> but um, I would say too, and I fully support moving ahead with um, technology. It is necessary to keep up with the latest and greatest. But I would always say, in cases like you would find in Africa or other areas where it maybe it's not as densely populated or there is a such a vast space that drone technology may not work, we still rely on human intelligence. Um, it is extremely important that we rely on partners and host nations and others that provide intelligence to, uh, whether it's through our intelligence agencies or the DOD, uh, we still have to do that. And so that leads into a greater discussion about partnerships and where we need to go as, uh, as a DOD. We can't cover down on every situation in every country, and that's why we need priorities, whether that's set by the national defense strategy or otherwise, we have to prioritize where do the United States interests lie and how much are we going to commit to those priorities. We will need to rely heavily on our partner nations again, and that's why I do believe that the train advise assist missions, whether we are 
uh, enabling the host nations by using soft operators for training, where, whether we're using the new SFAB, uh, the Security Forces and Assistance uh, Brigade that we have. However we can do that, we have to expect that our partners will ante up a little more in moving forward, especially when it comes to counterterrorism, because the United States simply can't do it all. What do you say to your constituents? Or, I mean, what are the questions, first of all, that you're getting? Is it, you know, thinking back to the president's campaign years, is it, you know what, enough is enough. We're winning these wars. It's 17 years in Afghanistan and, and 15 in Iraq, and, and we need to pull out of this stuff. Or are you getting the others who are saying, Keep it going, you know. Fight those ISIS, you know, guys. Keep it going throughout. And then, someone, when something like Niger happens, and four Americans are killed, and it creates a backlash when most folks don't understand just how how widespread these operations already are. I mean, there were 900, you know, forces in just in Niger alone at that mm -hmm. time. I I do hear from constituents there, and it is a good mix of folks that say, "Why are we still engaging in Iraq and and Syria? How, you know, how did we end up in Syria um, with Afghanistan? Why are we still engaging there?" But I think in, in Iowa, especially, we're a state of three million people. We're in the middle of the country. Uh, but we have a very heavy veteran population. We have over 200,000 uh, veterans in the state of Iowa. About 7% or greater of our population are veterans. And so you really can't go anywhere without hitting a veteran or someone that's currently serving in the reserves or National Guard. So what do you families say to get that. What, they, is, what, what, what get do you it. say to them? They want stability. And so that's, that is my push is that we, as a leader in the world, should provide stability. Does that require our human capital, or can we rely on others for their human capital? And that's why I think the Train Advice Assist missions, uh, whether we're working with an Afghan Air Force, whether we're working with the Afghan Security Forces, they need to ante up. They need to show us that they can take control in their own country. And if we can provide uh, a measure of reassurance to them, um, then that's, that's appropriate. But we shouldn't be spending the type of dollars that we are and continuing to engage. Same question to you. Yeah, they, what, what I hear is uh, you know, it's mixed, as uh, Senator Ern said, but uh, I think folks want to see us be successful when we are engaged in operations wherever they may be. So people want to, Americans uh, like success. They want to see results. So when you don't get success results, then they start asking questions, and those questions will increase, and they do increase intensity of spending in the military, crowds out things that are helping them and their families and the daily challenges that they have. And they wonder what kind of where are those priorities broadly? Not just it's not a bucket of just national security priorities. It's uh, everything else from retirement security to health care to infrastructure. Right now, I mean, the questions I get as people is why are we spending all this money in countries around the world when my roads have huge potholes in them and I just damaged the axle of my car? And and what's happening? We've been in Afghanistan for. 16 years, and uh, we're hearing it's a stalemate there, and we're doing the same thing we've done for 16 years. Uh, what has changed? You know, those are those are real questions that we have to figure out, uh, and it's gonna. And if there isn't significant changes, it's gonna have an impact on what we're spending uh, on defense and going forward. But, but um, you know, it's 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 a complex set of issues. But people have patience, but there's a limit to that patience. So we're inside 10 minutes already. <laughs> I know I want to make sure the audience has a chance for a couple questions. Um, there's a little bit of news this week that I can ask you about. Uh, one is this shakeup and the president's cabinet coming. Um, uh, bottom line up front, as they say, Bluff, uh, would you vote to confirm uh, Mike Pompeo at State Department and why? And I, in, in my head, the, the, number, the main concern, not so much as the politics, but the idea of having the chief of intelligence become the nation's chief diplomat. Are you concerned about that? Yes, I'll say that. <laughs> I'll take it first for Jody, our first Senator Ernst. I'll take it first. Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, I mean, I'll, I'll wait. Uh, there's a process that we we go through. I have serious concerns about that and uh, his background and experience at a time when we are in such a, a for all the things you mentioned, a dangerous part uh, or time in our in our history. We've got uh, things going on in North Korea. We've got a president that wants to go over and uh, chat with uh, with the leader there. Uh, we don't have senior diplomats uh, involved. That gets me uh, 
uh, very nervous. I think it gets a lot of folks nervous to go forward. So you need somebody with a depth of experience that's going to be able uh, to lead that department. Already the department has, the morale is very low. Uh, they don't feel there's a real direction there. They don't feel there's support there. Uh, you're going to, you, I would hope you could bring somebody in that could restore the morale of the Department of State and set a course to understand that diplomacy is absolutely critical for national security. And, you know, General Mattis uh, said it very well. He goes, if we don't, if we don't have a strong and vibrant uh, State Department, uh, you better buy me more bullets uh, because the demands for the Department of Defense are going to go up uh, considerably. Uh, and we just talked about why we can't keep doing that and the, the money involved. Money spent in diplomacy is really well spent money and efficient money, but you need an experienced leader in charge. Uh, I don't think he has that experience. I always keep an open mind, let him go through the process, but I have serious reservations. I, I have less reservations maybe than, than Gary does. Uh, I do want to express my, my thanks and gratitude to Secretary Tillerson because I, I do think he was a steadying influence within the department. Um, moving forward with uh, Director Pompeo, uh, I have had the opportunity to work a little bit with him in the past um, during his time in Congress. And of course, uh, before that, he had served in the military, honorable um, service. And so I do think he, he brings a level of knowledge now that he has served as the director of the CIA into this position. Um, I do hope that he can provide the leadership for that department because the, the State Department is so critical for everything that we do. And, and one thing that I appreciated about uh, Rex Tillerson was the fact that he engaged so much with Secretary Mattis. They had daily conversations. They ate breakfast together at least once a week. They conferred back and forth. Um, one did not make a move without consulting the other because we he they did not want to upset the balance out there. So I would like to see a little bit of continuity. Um, our State Department is very important. Uh, we need them to do what they do well so that the DOD has to do less of what they do well. Well, thank you. So we are a, a concern and a hope, I guess. We'll leave, we'll leave it at that, and we'll, we'll look forward to the confirmation hearings to come. Uh, thank you. So I want to reach out to the audience. If we have uh, questions, this is your time. We have a lot to talk about, others. If, if not, I'll move on. Okay, we have up front here. We have a hand. See. We have a microphone coming. And we are inside a five minute window, so keep it brief. Introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, Senators, thank you for your remarks. Aftab Hussein from Grant Thornton. Um, as you look at the state of the uh, Department of Defense, there hasn't been a significant reorganization since the Goldwater Nichols Act. Um, do you think that the current organization of the department is, 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 is in the right place to deal with transnational threats as well as kind of major threats from uh, nation states? Go ahead, a Goldwater Nichols question. Oh, That's great. Well, I think that, um, yes, you are correct. We haven't had a major shakeup, but I do, I do see some small changes occurring as we recognize uh, the different aspects, especially with counterterrorism. It's, it's a new, um, new take on an, an old idea. We have our operators covering down on counterweapons of mass destruction. I don't see a large change up coming maybe until we see some of our, I hate to go back to the audit, but once we start seeing results coming in from the audit, how we're directing our dollars, how those dollars are being well spent, maybe not as well spent, then I think we can go back and have an informed decision-making process on how we would make changes within the Pentagon. So let's get, to, we have to wrap up uh, at our time, but in your final thoughts, um, you know, think about this presidency and this time we're in. We have, you know, a Pentagon that, again, is just coming to its own footing with its policy staff. We're at the, at the beginning of this administration with one year on. What do you want to see in the year ahead? This is all about the year ahead. What do you want to see out of this White House when it comes to the stability that, that the, both industry is looking for, that the Pentagon is looking for, that the world is looking for? Well, I'll start. Uh, I would like to see fewer tweets. Is that possible to get uh, to do that? I have no control uh, over those. Fewer uh, tweets would be really a, a good thing. I'd like uh, more tweets. But. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, uh, so journalists love tweets. Uh, there's no shortage of material. Every I get that, but but we got to we got to stop uh, having the shiny object over here and then the shiny object over there. And uh, there's got to be more of a focus. It's so such a distraction uh, of what we're dealing with. We have to have a coherent forward policy. And 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 what I you know certainly we we can talk about. We've talked about some of the immediate threats that we have to deal with. And I think part of it, if you can get just coherent and not have all these distractions, we can deal with that. But I really believe that we've got to have a coherent strategy how we look out the next five to ten years and how the transformation of technology is going to change everything about warfare. It's going to change power balances. You're going to have smaller countries that are going to be able to have a really a pretty potent punch with a lot less money because of drones and autonomy and, uh, and uh, AI systems. We didn't even talk about cyber. Cyber is such a significant threat, and you can do that on the cheap. Uh, you can change uh, with through political warfare. You can have a major impact on a country's political environment. They're, these are significant challenges that we have never grasped with to the extent that we're going to be doing in the uh, forward. And if I look at the, the technological changes, we're probably one of the most exciting times in human history to live right now. It's also probably one of the more scary times when you consider the pace of that change. And what we saw in change uh, over 150 years of the Industrial Revolution, which was very positive, it wasn't always all positive. We had world wars, we had uh, labor strife, we had the rise of communism, we had the rise of fascism. It was a pretty rough time during that kind of transition time. We're probably in a transition time equal to that now, with the exception it won't be 150 years, it's going to be 20 years or 30 years. Compress all of that in 20 or 30 years. If we're not thinking about that now, this is going to come up and, and hit us really, really hard. Uh, and it could actually hit us very hard in the core foundation of our democracy and the system that we have against adversaries that have a very different system and are very focused on these kinds of changes in ways that they're going to radically transform how conflict in the future occurs. So that's what I'm worried about. And I agree with Gary on fewer tweets. Um, I think it's easier for, for us absolutely to focus on our, on our duties and our job as Congress um, when we maybe don't have as many distractions out there. But focusing it back to the DOD, I, I want to see continuity. I want to see stability. You mentioned that. Um, stability moving forward. And I do wish that our DOD could be more nimble when it comes to technology. And nimble and DOD don't go hand in hand. Um, but if we can make improvements in that area, we simply need to do that. But I do have the full faith and confidence in our leaders, those that have been appointed so far within the DOD, our secretaries. Uh, I do see that they are doing the absolute best they can, given the, the constraints that they have placed upon them. Uh, we have wonderful... Uh, highly skilled leaders that are leading our combatant commands. Uh, they report to Congress. They let us know what's going on. Uh, I have full faith in them. Uh, but stability is important. Our diplomats. Um, we want to ensure that we are providing the supports necessary for our diplomats because when we need to call on the DOD, it's when diplomacy fails. So we should always start with diplomacy first and move to defense second. Um, if we can do that, I think that, that we have a bright future. But it's uh, uncertain times right now. But uh, I am I am hopeful. I am that eternal optimist. And, and I know that our war fighters are the best trained fighting forces in the world. And unfortunately, we rely very heavily on them. Let's put a little more towards our diplomats. Uncertain times. That's a that's a diplomatic way to put it. So <laughs> if Pompeo doesn't make it through, maybe you will for, for, for state. Um, I, I wish we could go on for 40 minutes more on, on the rest of the world, but thank you very much for your time and for walking us through some issues and priorities you have. It will be an interesting and challenging year. Uh, we look forward to it, and we'll be keeping our eye on both of you and the committee. Uh, thank you, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. A round of applause for our, our senators. We'll have a, a next brief message from Daniela and be back with our second panel.